Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a Thursday afternoon at Cam 1105 with your host, me, Dr. White. Hi, everybody. All right, a lot to do today, so I better get started. First of all, let's go to Blackboard. And on your screen, you'll see I sent out this morning uh, information about test number one. Next Thursday, the 29th, I'll be giving test number one online. How will I do that? Well, you'll be downloading a password protected PDF file for test number one from the assignment area Blackboard that will be available on Thursday. And on Thursday at 8 a.m., I will send out an email with the password for test number one PDF file, which will allow you to open it up. You will have until Friday, the next day, 6.30.23, 4 p.m., to finish test number one and upload test number one answers as a single PDF file, just like you've been doing the labs. And that will be to the assignment area Blackboard. Like I said, like you were doing the lab. If we are face-to-face, -face, most students are done test number one, 45 minutes or less. But since you're gonna be at home and I don't have to get out of the classroom for the next class, if you need up to three hours, take it. All right, now, test number one will cover the materials in chapters one, two, three, along with appendix is A2 and A4 in our textbook that I have already covered in lecture. Now, test number one has 100 points with 29 problems. Relax, my tests are written, so you should be done at the worst in 45, 50 minutes if you studied. If you haven't studied, we could have all day and it won't help you. But test number one has 29 problems there's seven multiple choice. The rest are just like you've seen in the practice problems. And it has eight pages. And this includes a page with key formulas. As you know, I've shown you in the lecture folder of Blackboard, test number one, important information. And those are the things you don't have to memorize. Now, there'll also be a periodic table for you to download and use while taking test number one. Use that periodic table only. Now, you will need a scientific calculator, like the one I've shown you. That will help. All right, now listen carefully. I reserve the right to subtract up the, yes, 50 points. Yes, 50 points for anyone who does not <clears throat> follow instructions or anyone who does not upload your test answers on time as a single PDF file. Now, this test and all my tests will not, oh, I don't know, hold on. That's, that's better. Will not be open notes. That means you don't go on the internet, you don't look in your book, and you don't ask anybody. I'll be very honest with you right now. And that is, I have been doing online courses now for a couple of years. And what you don't know is Dr. White can be very clever. And I put things in my test that will tell me if a student has cheated. Cheating meaning looking at your notes, your book, or going online or getting help. So don't, please, that's called cheating and I'll do what's in my syllabus. All right, now, a couple important things. I will be posting test number one scores by the following Sunday, 1 p.m. or earlier on Blackboard. And at that time, I'll post an announcement and that will also send an email to you that your test scores, number one, are in Blackboard. I also will email each individual student's, student the points that you receive for each problem and each part of a problem if it's multiple part for test number one. Now, 
on the Monday after test number one, next Monday, or not next Monday, a week from this Monday, the Monday after test number one, I will go over the answers for test number one in our Zoom meeting. But I'll cut that out of the uh, Zoom meeting YouTube video. However, I will create a private YouTube video with the answers for test number one, and I'll send you an email with the URL for that video. I just don't want it publicly on YouTube for the rest of infinity. All right, I'll do a review of the material on test number one in our Tuesday's Zoom meeting before the 29th, which I guess would be the 27th which would be next week. Now, please note that we'll have our regular Zoom meeting on that Thursday, the 29th, but you'll have all day and all night and the rest of the good part of Friday to take test number one. Now, a couple other things I didn't write in here. Just like in the lab, if you don't have a printer, what you can do is on pieces of paper, and don't try and crowd everything on one piece of paper. Don't push it all together because it's hard for me to grade. If it's hard for me to grade, I can make mistakes. I don't want that to make mistakes on grading. You don't want me to. But write your answers. If you don't have a printer and you're writing your answers, write the question number and your answer. You do not. You do not have to rewrite the questions. And then as you've done with your lab, if you don't have a scanner, like I have a printer scanner there, if you don't have a scanner, use your cell phone or someone else's. I think all of you probably have cell phones and take pictures and convert them into a single PDF file. I have files will be in the test download area or you, uh, assignment area, just like the lab, how to do that using cam scammer or just with your cell phone. And that's test number one. Now, I highly recommend you do the practice problems. If you can do the practice problems correctly, you will do good on test number one. Same thing for two, three, four, and the final. But you gotta do the, gotta, you have to do the practice problems if you wanna get a good grade on test number one. All right. Any questions about test number one? Uh, you can type on the PDF file. Uh, sometimes you'll be asked to draw some things and that's why uh, you may not be able to do all the answers on test on typing. But if you can type it, go right ahead. I'm trying to think. This one, you probably could do the whole thing typing out. All right, any other questions? All right, let me remind you before uh, we go further, don't forget the hand in labs. There's one due today, the one I did on Tuesday. Remember, all the labs, you can look at the Tuesday and Thursday videos and I go through the lab and be sure to read everything in the assignment area. And I'll explain why now. Let me go to student view. The lab we did Tuesday, if you look at the scientific method, or actually the one we did before Tuesday, last Thursday, scientific method, hopefully you've handed it in, not handed in. Notice I have two YouTubes and one of them shows you how to do graphing. And Let's open this up.
And so if I have a video for you to watch, make sure you look at that. And today's If you notice today's lab, which I'm going to go through in about 30 seconds, exploring density. Remember, you have to do a selfie. And here, for how to graph and determine the slope in Microsoft Excel, see the following video. I'm going to show it to you again today. But don't forget, if you need to see that again, there's the link. All right, let's get to work and talk about today's lab. Now, today's lab is exploring density. And density is an important property of different things. And density, by definition, is mass divided by weight of an object. And usually, the density is expressed uh, as a number of grams per milliliter. Now, they say here cubic centimeters, and one cubic centimeter is one milliliter. Generally, you see density in grams per milliliter because you can replace that as they tell you. And different things weigh different densities, have different densities. Steel and sand, a feather and water all have different densities. Now, you'll be doing a graph to find a density. And the graph of a line, if you had algebra right, or geometry, I forgot where they taught that in high school. It's been a long time. But y equals mx plus b. Now, for our graph, m is going to be the density for a graph. And I'll talk about that later. Now, one thing I don't see here, but I assumed I'll talk about, but I'm going to talk about it right now. When it comes to density, all right, first of all, I forgot, you people don't know. Gram density is grams per milliliter. That's mass or weight per volume. Now, the important thing I want to talk about density is First of all, lower density objects float in higher density liquids. If you take a feather, and a feather I think has a density of 0 0.01 or 001 grams per milliliter, and you put it in water,
and water is 1.00 grams per milliliter, the feather will float. Now, if you had a piece of, say, um, iron, which has or lead that has density of 15, and you put it in a bucket of water, it's going to sink. And that's the other thing. Oops, the nut float. Let's try that again. All right, let's go through this again. Lower density objects float in higher density liquids. So if you take a feather or cork material, which is lower density than water, it will float on water. Now, higher density objects will sink in lower density liquids. So if you take a cannonball made of lead and put it in a barrel of water, it's higher density, it goes boom right to the bottom. I don't know if it goes boom, but it sinks real quick. So you should remember for this lab, important thing is lower density objects float in higher density liquids and higher density objects sink in lower density liquids. Now, here's the equipment you will need for today's lab from your kit. And where do you find these cylinders? Well, in my kit, and I assume it's the same with yours, you'll see a green bag that says small items enclosed. And if I go in there, I've got small items. And in here, I never opened this up. This is the first time. Last time I just showed it. You've got small items. Aren't they cute? They're really small, too, especially with my big fingers. <laughs> but anyways, you have three different items you'll need. Don't forget, for today's lab, as all labs, you should wear, well, wear them properly, your safety goggles and wear gloves. Even though you're wear, working with something, quote unquote, non-hazardous, you should always do that doing a lab. Now, you'll be using your balance again. When you turn it on, you probably can't see it, make sure there's a letter G up there. If not, use the mode button to click it till the letter G is up there. To zero it, click on tear. Now, one of the new things you'll be using today, and they're cool, now you know I'm a chemist, is this called the wave boat. Well, I don't know about it, but it's called the wave boat. And what you do, you put it on here and you zero it. Then you put material, say you need five grams of sugar, you weigh out five grams of sugar in here. If this is if you're gonna use the weigh boat. And the nice thing about a weigh boat is you grab both corners opposite, pull up, and you can tap and put it into 
a whatever, beaker, cup, and that's how you use a weigh boat. You weigh things in here, and then to put it in something, you squeeze like that, it's thin material, and you can pour it there, and that's a weigh boat. Let me turn off my balance. Now, other things you'll need here are listed here. You've already done it. The ruler should be in your kit. Now, for this lab, there's some things that you have to supply yourself. First of all, you'll need sugar, otherwise known as sucrose, which is about 250 grams. That's about uh, roughly a half a pound of sugar. The cheapest place, in case you don't have sugar, I know to buy sugar nowadays is Walmart. I don't get any kickbacks from them, but over the last two years, they've been the lowest price for a four pound bag of sugar. It's about $2. Now here they say water bottled or purified. No, you can use for this lab tap water. It will be all right. We're in the Chicagoland area. Our water isn't that bad. All right, now you'll also need a can or 100 milliliters of an, and this is important, non-diet beverage containing natural sugar. Now, what do they mean by natural sugar? Either it says on the label, sucrose, or it can say high fructose corn syrup. And if you buy anything, by the way, my favorite pop, which I cut back on because of certain personal problems, but I still like it once in a while. Besides Dr. Pepper's, Dr. Pepper. Is this and it's called Verner's, and I've been drinking it for eons, <laughs> a long time, at least since high school. And this stuff is a very, very highly carbonated, slightly spicy ginger ale. It's really good. And the place I always get it is Jewel. And remember, if you buy this or any other, get the regular. You don't want the zero sugar pop. You want sugar to be in there or probably fructose corn syrup. And you'll need graphing programs such as Microsoft Excel, which you can get Microsoft version of small, I think it's called Microsoft 365, free through COD. All right, now one of the things you'll be making are solutions. And here you'll be making One, two, well, actually, this is pure water, but 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60%. Now, what you'll do is, ah, I forgot to bring the cups. You'll take a cup and you'll label it 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60%. If you don't want to put the percent sign, just know you can just put the numbers and then label a last one, beverage. I see a question. If you have your own plastic cups or whatever, that will work too. They ripped you off, huh? All right, now, if you, if a carbonated beverage is to be used, which it is, open the can a day before you do the lab, because what you want to do is get the gas carbon dioxide out of there. In other words, have it go flat, as we call it. Now, here's what you're going to do to make the solutions. And you're going to use your balance to measure the sugar and then use the graduated cylinder for the water. Now, it's important to be accurate. 
use the spoon they give you in the weigh boat to weigh out the amount of sugar you need. And then here, like for 10%, weigh 5.5 .5 and try and be accurate. You can take out or put back in. And your balance reads to two significant figures past the decimal. So if you're at 5.49 or 5.52, that's okay. But if you're supposed to be 5.5 .5 and you're at 5.7 or 4.3, no, you either got to take some out or add it. Now, what you'll do for the weight of the water, 50 grams, you will, in your graduated cylinder, put in 50 milliliters, but first tear this, zero it, and you'll put in enough water that on your balance, it will say 50 grams. If you're at 49.9 or 50.2, that's okay, but if it's supposed to be 50 and you're at 48, no put more water in. If you're up, over, take some out. Now, if you're getting close, use your one of the eyedroppers they give you. Now, so you're gonna make these solutions and you'll take five grams of water, uh, five grams of sugar, put it in a cup with the weigh boat, and then put in the 50 milliliters of water, which is actually 50 grams, and you can use this to get that. And then the second 20%, you'll use 12.5 grams of sucrose and 50 grams of water. And you weigh it out, the water, and do that for all those. Now, when you put, after you've done them all, take your spoon, rinse it with a little clean water from your tap, because you can use tap water, take the spoon and stir it until all the sugar is dissolved. Now, as they say here, the 50 and 60% may not dissolve easily. It would help to warm it in a microwave using about 10 seconds on high. You don't want it boiling and then stir it. And then before you can use it, it's got to cool off the room temperature. They tell you it might look slightly yellow. And then wrap plastic wrap over the top and you should use them or use them within 48 hours. All right, let's look at what you're gonna be doing. Part one, activity or activity one. You're gonna take each of these small pieces, you'll measure the diameter and you'll measure the height. Now, You'll also measure the weight. If you look at table one, you have the aluminum, which is silver, the acrylic plastic, which is clear, and the polyethylene, which is the white one. And you'll weigh each one. You'll get the height. You'll get the diameter. Now, for the volume, you'll need the radius. And the radius is diameter divided by two, right up here. The radius is the diameter divided by two. So you'll get that number. And finally, you'll calculate the volume. The volume is right here, pi, which is 3.14 times the radius squared, r times r, times the height. Now, your calculator has a way of squaring things, but it would be easier to multiply 3.14, let's assume your radius is two, times two, then a second times two, and then times the height. This would be easier for most of you, unless you know how to use your calculator. Let's go over here. All right, where did I hide? There it is.
the radius r is the diameter divided by two. The volume equals pi r squared times the height. The radius is the height, not diameter. And for you, the easy way to do it would be multiply 3.4 times r, then times r again, then times h. And that will give you the volume of each of these cute little pieces that they give you. And hold on, somebody has a question. Okay. And let's get back. Now, from that, you will calculate the density. How do you calculate the density? The density is the mass divided by your calculated volume. So for aluminum, whatever you get the mass, you'll divide it by the volume that you just calculated, and that will give you the density. And that's activity number one. Now, activity number two, you'll add five grams of water, that's a 0% solution, to 50 milliliter uh, graduated cylinder. Now, use your pipette. I hope it goes all the way down here. And to make sure it's there, it's five milliliters by here. And remember, the meniscus is the U. It won't be flat. You want the five to be right at this line, the U part of it of water. Then you'll, uh, before you do that, weigh the empty graduated cylinder. Then what you'll do is record the mass, and mass is, I use the term weight, of the water and the graduated cylinder. Then you'll add enough till it's at exactly 10 milliliters on your graduated cylinder, record that total mass, and you'll keep on adding it to 15, record it 20, then 25. And if you look in table two, here's the mass of the graduated cylinder plus the liquid. And here's the mass of the graduated cylinder. You do that before, and this number should be the same all the way down or after each run. And then the mass of the solution is the graduated cylinder and mass subtracting the mass of the cylinder. So this column minus that gives you the mass. You'll repeat the same thing with your 10% solution. I would, for each one, before you do it, reweigh the graduated cylinder because you might have a few drops of water in there if you haven't shaken it all out. So you shake it out. And you do that for all these, all right, through 60%. Now, for table three, you need to find the density of each solution, which means you've got to graph that. And if you look at lab four, you'll see here how for how to graph and determine the slope in MS Microsoft. Excel, see the following video, notice at 2425. You can watch most of it because you'll see me do the same lab again. And let's go look at that video right now. We do the same lab in 1212. Let me check one thing. Yep. Good morning, everybody. Welcome oh, to Tuesday wow, morning the same time. 1211 with your host, me, Dr. White. All right. Uh, Anna, I'll answer your question. We have to do once. And then you'll weigh it with five milliliters, add more, weigh it again, and again, and again. And you do that for all the solutions. And so it's going to take some time. It will. Now, 
you have to graph this, but how do we do graphic? Watch you know, this closely and you can go back and look at this video. Took me a while to open up the file. I don't know why, but it did. Can we maybe draw this on the paper? Uh, hold on, let me find. All right, what? Let me do this. First of all, you all have access, and I'll send out an email to get to have free download for Microsoft Office and Microsoft Excel, which I'm using. You can also use, and I haven't used it in a couple of years, but Google, if you have a Google email account, Google also has a spreadsheet available to you. But watch carefully, and you can come back and watch the video again. Notice right here, I put in the volume for one of my runs and what the density is. And how do you measure density? The weight divided by the volume of the material. And I'll go back and show you that again. Well, let's see how to graph this. If you notice right here, I have step-by-step -step instructions. Make the chart, fill in the data. I've done that. Highlight it. Then you click on insert. And then see here, recommended charts. Click on that. The one with the line of dots, you click on. And I'm going to hit OK. And here's my chart. Now, here's the important thing you got to know how to do. Click on the line. And then right click. And then scroll down to add trend line. Click on that. Let me move us over here. And then where it says display equation on chart, click on that. And where it says set intercept, click on that. And this number in the box should be 0, 0.0. And if you notice right here, it says y equals 1.1807x. That's your equation. That number in front of x is the density. The slope of the line is the density. So for this liquid, whichever one, one of your sucrose solutions, the density would be the three significant figures, 1.18, because that's how you round it off, the three significant figures. So feel free to come back to this video. Again, make the chart, fill in the data. Don't forget, and you don't have it, but put volume zero, density zero in there. Highlight this. Click on insert. Click on recommended problem charts. Click on the one with the dot and then OK. And you'll get this. Click on the line. Then where it says format trend line, click on set internet to zero. Equation display, equation on chart. And this where it says right here, and let me make it larger so you can see it. Y equals 1.1807X. That number is your density. And here's where for each one, you don't have to put the equation in, just put the density, which is the slope. It even says that. So you don't have to. Now, here they're going to ask you, will it sink or float? And here what you're going to do is test the prediction by putting each one in the solution you predict the aluminum is likely to sink in. 
So in each of your cups, you can do the prediction. If you don't, uh, I don't care. <laughs> Put down your observation. Which one of these in each one did it sink or flow? And you'll do that. Now, for the beverage, what you'll do, you'll weigh the graduated cylinder, it should be the same. You'll put in five, and they made a mistake here. See where it has 5%? It really should be five milliliters, no percent right there. Unfortunately, I can't erase it. You'll put in five milliliters, and this you use volume, not weight, and weigh the cylinder. And you'll have a mass and a volume. And you divide the mass, which is the weight of the cylinder and the beverage minus the weight of the cylinder. And then you can graph that just like I did, and you'll get the percent sucrose. Uh, based on the slope, you can look at the different slopes you had from your earlier one and the density of this, which is closest to the densities of the different percent of sucrose you did earlier, that will tell you what was the density of sugar or the amount percent of sugar in the lab. All right. And what you'll do is today's lab, you'll go. All right, let's get back. So that video tells you how to do part of the lab. And we're back live. You'll, again, from the slope of the line for your sucrose solutions, you'll get the densities. And then each one, like I said, you don't have to put the predictions in, but you do have to say in pure water, you put the aluminum cylinder and you write down, does it float or sink? The acrylic, does it float or sink? The polyethylene cylinder, does it float or sink? And then you do it for the other sucrose solutions. Now, for this one, what you'll do, and like I said, they don't, that percent shouldn't be there. You'll take five milliliters. You'll first of all, take your graduated cylinder, weigh it empty, then put in five milliliters of your pop that's been, or beverage that has sugar in it. And for all of you, it's probably going to be pop. Remember in Chicago, we call it pop, not soda. But anyways, you put it in there, you weigh the beverage in the cylinder, then you can put in more to get 10 milliliters, you'll weigh it, and then you'll get the graphs of the beverage. And then you can, just like I showed for the other, for the sucrose, you'll graph um, volume versus weight, and the slope of that will be your density of the beverage. And whatever that density is, you go back and look at this table, and whichever one it's closest to, you put it down. Now, I'm going to do something totally fictitious because it won't be. Let's say the density of the 50% is, I don't know, 9.00 grams per milliliter. I don't know if that's valid or not. And your density of the beverage was 8.9. Well, in that case, the nine density of the 50%, wherever that is, is close to what you got for the beverage. So that would tell you, and again, this is hypothetical, that the beverage uh, density or percent sucrose would be 50%. And that's how you answer that.
Now in the write-up, you'll fill out table one, which you had for before. Now here's the accepted values. If yours is way off, go back and check your calculation that you've made a mistake somewhere. Usually that's where a student makes a mistake. If, if you get a density of 50 for aluminum and it's supposed to be 2.7, you've made a mistake, go back and check. Otherwise I'm gonna take off points. Same thing for the other two. You'll fill this in from the, we saw before. Answer to questions. You'll, you don't have to put this column in with the equation. This put the slope to three significant figures, unless you want to do more, I'm not going to stop you, right here. And they say insert graph table right here. You want to have it as a separate file where you copy it onto a piece of paper like in Microsoft Word and upload that file, that's fine. But please don't, well, I take a bath. You want to upload your Excel table, you can too. And here, you only have to do your observations, don't have to do the predictions. And here again, you copy from the other the same table and you answer that and then answer these questions you'll use your um, graphs to help you answer that. And with that, that's today's lab. Wow, that was a lot to do today. All right, if I look at the clock, it's time for a blur break. Let's take a five minute break. We'll come back and we'll continue with the lecture. And also if you have any questions about the lab. See you in five.
Sorry about the delay. I just had to check to make sure I had everything open. I do now. So, time to get going again. All right. Home stretch. It's Thursday. Unless you want to watch my video tomorrow, you don't have to see me anymore this week. That was wrong. <laughs> All right. Now, yesterday, I started talking about polyatomic ions. I'll never ask on a test, what is a polyatomic ion? But you should be familiar with that. It's a group of atoms that have acquired an electrical charge, which is shared among the atoms of that group. So instead of just having one atom with a charge, these are a bunch of atoms together that share a charge. Now, naming switches off, click. But there are a few I would like you to know the name. And yesterday, you should be familiar, NO3 minus is nitrate. Another important one is HCO3 minus, and that's bicarbonate. Now, later on near the end of the semester, I'll talk about the hydronium ion and the hydroxide. And one other one, nitrate and nitrite. I'm not going to ask you what's the chemical formula for nitrate or nitrite, but you should be familiar with it. And also sulfate. The other ones I'll talk about, but these are the important ones for right now. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's find out. And yesterday, I asked you to learn how to do the following. Instead of give, I could also have written draw. Now, before I already did a problem like this, three points each give the empirical formula for the molecule with the following ions. And what you should remember always is All molecules have a net zero charge. I wrote it in red because it's important. So how do we use this for a polyatomic ion? Well, let's look at the following. What would be the empirical formula with sodium plus cations and bicarbonate, that's HCO3 minus anion? Well, how do you do that? Well, this has a plus one charge. This has a minus one charge. It has to add up to zero. Does it? 
It does. So that tells me I have one sodium and one bicarbonate. And we write when there's one like that. And I should tell you, this has a name. This is sodium bicarbonate. And you find it in baking soda. And later semester, I'll tell you a story about baking soda and my father and something else, but that's later in the semester. But in case you're not familiar with it, I can spell. And also baking powder. And you'll see they have different uh, brands. Interesting name, Gabbler Girl is from a company in Indiana. And, huh, the one I always buy, I don't see right now. Here it is. This my mother was buying for eons and I buy it, Calumet, Calumet, and that's a good one. And any of the other brands are probably just as good. Now, let's look at something else when it comes to polyatomic ions. And here we have what would be the empirical formula with a molecule that has magnesium plus two cations and nitrate minus one, that's NO3 minus one anions. Well, it's still true. All molecules should have a net zero charge. So what that means is this is a plus two, this is a minus one, and it should add up to zero. Oh no, it doesn't. What do we do? Well, you can't change the charge. Students try to do that and it's wrong, but you can change how many there are of that ion. To get it to zero, I need two of the nitrate because then it would be plus two from the magnesium and each nitrate would give a minus one times two is minus two. And now it's gonna add up to zero. Well, that tells me in the molecule magnesium nitrate, I have one magnesium, but how do I show two nitrates? Use a bracket, put the ion that you're gonna have two of or more than two, and then subscript the number two. Again, to show this polyatomic ion that you need two of them, you need a bracket, and then to the right subscript, right here, you put the number how many you have. When it's only one, like in the first case here, you don't use a bracket. But when there's two or more, you need to put things in a bracket. So I better share the fun. What would be the empirical formula for a molecule with sodium plus cations and sulfate SO4 minus two anions? Your turn.
remember if you're done, just say yes. And if you're not done, say yes when you're done. Or if you want me to go ahead and do it, say yes. So I'm gonna do the poll again. I, I haven't figured out how to eliminate choice two, but let's do this again. Answer the poll again. All right. All right, so how do we do this? Well, all molecules have a net zero charge. This is a plus one. This is a minus two. That has to add up to zero. Oh, it doesn't. Well, we got a minus two. We need a plus two. You cannot change the charge. If you find a way of doing that with sodium, let me know. We'll be rich beyond my wildest dreams. In other words, it doesn't happen. But I can't have two of them. And now I will have two times plus one is plus two, plus minus two is. Ah, thank you. I'm glad everybody enjoys my humor. Uh, gets you to zero. So how do we write that? Now, this tells me we have need to sodium. Well, and we need one sulfate. And that's it. This is called sodium sulfate. And if you ever bought something like electronics or optical things like binoc binoculars, microscope or anything, certain electronics like a cell phone, you'll see a little, and also a sin actually, if you buy certain, um, what's the dried seaweed called? I forgot the name of it. I buy it once in a while. The little packets that say, don't eat this because that's used to absorb water. And what's in those little packets to absorb water is sodium sulfate, Na2SO4, which I just showed you. Now, long time ago, we had a flood in our house when I was in high school, I think, or earlier. And we had an unfinished uh, part of the basement, a crawl space that got wet too. And the other stuff we could mop up and dry up. And we had a humidifier, but it was taking too long. My father, being a pharmacist who knew chemistry, knew about sodium sulfate, went and through someone he knew, got a 15 or more than that, 50 pounds of that, and some block buckets and some cloth bags or uh, cheesecloth. And we hung them from the rafters from the floor above in the crawl space and absorb the water and drip down and dried out the crawl space. And here's one for you, calcium nitrite. You have a calcium plus two cation and a nitrite minus one anion. What would be the empirical formula for that molecule? Your turn. I see somebody already did it right. But let's wait for everybody to finish. And I better send a new poll out. Remember, when you're done, vote yes. Or if you want me to go ahead and do it, vote yes. All right. So how do we do this? Well, we remember. Uh, well, look, somebody wrote it. All molecules have a net zero charge. Therefore, this is a calcium, it's a plus two charge. And the nitrate, nitrite has a minus one charge. 
and has to equal zero. It doesn't. Well, what do we do? You can't change the charge, but you can change how many. And we need a minus two to cancel out and get to zero with the plus two. So I need two of those. And now how do we write this? This tells us when there's no number in front, it's one, one calcium. And here we have two of the nitrate. When we have more than one of a polyatomic ion, you have a bracket, write the ion, you don't show charges, close the bracket, then subscript, you need the number how many? And this is that. So that'd be calcium CA bracket NO2, close bracket subscript two. And that's how you do it. Oh, let's do one more. And why don't you take E, potassium plus, and nitrate minus one? And what would be the empirical formula for that? All right, my turn. Well, again, for these problems, all molecules have a net zero charge. So the charges have to add up to zero. The potassium cation is a plus one charge. That's what this means. And the nitrate right here tells me that's a minus one. And does it add up to zero? It does. So it tells me the molecule with these two ions has one potassium and one nitrate. And that's potassium nitrate. And that's how you do it. And if I go back here, I have the last slide clicked. Writing formulas for ionic, oh no, unclick, I've already done this. All ionically bonded molecules have a net zero charge. Follow the same charge balance rules for writing formulas for simple ionic compounds. We did that. Oh no, now I'm done. You wanna learn a secret? Shh, look in the lower, can you see it all in the lower left-hand corner? Oh, wait, um, yeah, you can see page 27 and 27. Give me a thumbs up if you can see it. Well, if you could see how you can, that tells me I'm done with this part of the chapter. So we're done with chapter four, part one, which means it's time to go to Chapter four, part two. And this continues our discussion with chemical bonds. Remember, chemical bonds are the forces that hold uh, atoms together in what we call a molecule. Now we talked about ionic bonds. Let's talk about covalent bonds. Now here, I'm not gonna ask you to memorize this, but a generalization from your book, covalent bonds are with similar identical atoms involved, and this is an important thing, sharing pairs of electrons, and the basic structural unit is still called the molecule. So this you should know. Whoops, that's not what I want. This is what I want.
You should know a covalent bond is a chemical bond between atoms resulting from the sharing of pairs of electrons. One, two, or three pair, you'll learn later on. <clears throat> and remember, a pair means two. I'll say that in slow motion. A pair means two. Now, let's talk about Lewis structure for molecules and polyatomic ions in molecules. And the first one we're going to deal with is, this is important, listen carefully, hydrogen gas, not the atoms, the gas. And each hydrogen atom has one electron and one valence electron. And hydrogen gas exists as H2. And I've worked with hydrogen gas, both in a laboratory and in a chemical plant. I ran reactions that I created, or I supervised, where we put in five, 6,000 pounds of hydrogen gas. Yep, five or 6,000 pounds. That's fun when you're doing that scale. Now, how do you draw the Lewis structure? First of all, as always, we only use valence electrons. That's not what I want. That's one thing and hang in there while I open up something else. If you're going to do Lewis structure of a molecule, you need to know the valence electrons for each element in that molecule. Now, hydrogen gas is H2. How many valence electrons does hydrogen have? Well, you look in the here, here's hydrogen. You look at the top, and the number there, either Roman or numeric, is one. Also, if you look at the atomic number, but that's the only case you can do that with on the whole periodic table. But for here, we have hydrogen, one valence electron. Remember, this material I'm covering now will not be on test number one, but will be on test number two. So first one, draw the Lewis structure for hydrogen gas. Well, hydrogen gas has two hydrogens, H2. And each hydrogen has one valence electron. So I'll have one hydrogen there and one hydrogen there. Now I'm showing you how the thought process is. And this hydrogen says to the other hydrogen, you didn't know atoms could talk. No, they really can't, but it's fun to think of it that way. I've got an unpaired electron, valence electron. You've got one, let's share. And they do. And this is the structure for the Lewis structure of hydrogen gas. And notice they're sharing a pair of electrons. And what that is, holding them together, is a covalent bond. So hydrogen shares 
two electrons with another. Each one brings one to the party and they share. And that's how you get a covalent bond. Now listen carefully. Unlike, and I'll show, I'll talk about this later, maybe on Monday if I don't get to it today, which I might not. Unlike the Lewis structure for elements, when you have molecules, sometimes you'll have more than two dots or valence electrons on a side. All right, now, when you form bonds, molecules like the lose gain for ionic compounds or for covalent share electrons. And the way they do that is such that if you count all the valence electrons shared and unshared, that atom should have an octet. An example being, the S and P orbitals, like if we were talking about two or uh, shells, subshells, two plus six, you fill up the S and P uh, shells, subshells for that shell. And these are valence electrons. Now, when we talk about, and I'll never ask you about what is the octet rule, but we'll see where it's in use. Now, Lewis structure for molecules molecular compounds, covalent. You have two types of electrons, bonded electrons. Those are pairs of valence electrons that are shared between atoms in a covalent bond. And you also have non-bonding pairs of electrons or bo uh, non-bonding electrons. Those are pair of valence electrons that are not involved in sharing. I'll never ask on a test what's a bonded electron or what's a non-bonding. But I will ask you to know how to find them in a molecule, so you'll need to know these definitions. So let's have some practice. First one, chlorine gas, which I worked with in a lab. Dangerous stuff, but it's useful, very useful. And that has a formula Cl2. So if we go back to our problem, we go back to our, come on, go back to our problem. All right, why aren't we going back there? Now we are. I think I, anyways, B would be draw the Lewis structure for chlorine gas. Cl2. Well, how do you do this? Well, you have to find out how many valence electrons chlorine has. And if we go to our neighborhood, friendly neighborhood periodic table, we find chlorine, Cl, and look on top, and it has seven valence electrons. The number on top is the number of valence electrons. So now we can go back to our problem. And we know each chlorine has seven valence electrons. So if I write this, remember for one dot on each side before you double up for the element. Now, this chlorine says to this chlorine, oh, look, I have an unpaired electron. You have an unpaired electron. Let's share. And they do. And what happens is they share a pair of electrons. Now, the other dots or pairs of electrons are still there. And this is the Lewis structure for chlorine gas. Now, let's talk about something. First of all, in red, 
I am going to circle the bonded electrons. And those two are shared, and that forms a covalent chemical bond. And the pair of electrons I just circled in red are the bonded electrons. Now, in blue, I'm going to circle all the non-bonding electrons. Those are pairs of electrons not involved in a chemical bond. And you see in chlorine gas, there are a lot of them. And each blue circle, if I can write clearly, So if I were to ask on a test, two po uh, three points each, first draw the Lewis structure for chlorine gas, and then I could ask a, a second part of the question, in chlorine gas, circle the bonded electrons, or I could ask circle the non-bonding electrons, those are them. The bonded electrons are the electrons involved in sharing between atoms, as you see in red. The non-bonding electrons are not being shared. Now, let me write the structure again. Now, the octet rule tells me each atom in a molecule with covalent bonds, or even ionic, but let's just talk about covalent, wants to have eight valence electrons, so it's stable. And if we look at this molecule, if we look at this chlorine right here, how many valence electrons does it have? both non-bonding and bonded. And if we look at that, how many dots in that sort of circle I just drew are there? Two, four, six, eight. So there's eight valence electrons in that chlorine. And the other chlorine, if we looked at the bonding and non-bonding electrons, I'll circle in blue, sort of circle. There's also eight valence electrons. So each chlorine is happy. You no know molecules and atoms could be happy or sad, but they're happy because they have their eight valence electrons, their octet. And why don't you try this one? Why don't you draw the Lewis structure for bromine gas? But before I do that, and the question is, is this table available? And Judith, the answer is yes. I think I have it. Hold on, let's find out. If not, I'll have to put it in there. Let's go to course information, lectures. Did you see all the way, Judith, at the bottom, the very last entry in the lecture section of Blackboard says periodic table. That's the periodic table. 
And also, am I good or am I good? Don't answer that. But anyways, uh, that's the table. When you take test number one, I'll have that in the assignment area where it has the PDF file. I'll also have the files on how to make PDF files and can scammer like I have in the lab. Well, thank you. And I'll have that also there too, in case you forgot where it was in the lecture section. All right, speaking about that periodic table, you need to find out how many valence electrons bromine has. I'll give you 10 seconds, then I'll do it. And the answer is no. Uh, we're talking about valence electrons. It's a good guess, but a wrong one. That's why we do practice. If we look at here, bromine, Br, is a halogen right below chlorine. And if we go to the very top of the periodic table, it has the number seven. And the numbers on top tell me valence electrons. The atomic number 35 tells me total electrons, but we're only interested now in the valence electrons. And that's why we do practice so you can make mistakes now and not in the test and get a better score, which I think is a good thing. I hope you think so too. So we now know Roaming has seven valence electrons. So this has seven valence electrons, each bromine. And why don't you try drawing the Lewis structure for bromine gas, Br2? Don't forget the non-bonding electrons. Hint to someone out there. And that's why uh, even in test one, you'll have to valence electrons of atoms. You may have to draw some because I don't think you can type it in that easily. At least I don't know how to do it. I haven't thought about it. All right, let's do it. Each bromine has seven valence electrons. And this bromine says to this bromine, I have an unpaired electron, valence electron. You do, let's share. And they do. And what happens is they share the two electrons between them, one from each. But the non-bonding electrons are still there. And that's the proper structure for bromine gas. Now, let's do one more, maybe more than one. Let's see how much time we have. And I'll do this one because I need to teach you something. And that's water. Hopefully by now you all know H2O is water. Well, how do you draw that Lewis structure for the molecule water? Well, you first have to find out how many valence electrons each hydrogen has and each oxygen has. And how do we do that? We go to our friendly neighborhood periodic table. And hydrogen right over here you go on top, the number in red, you don't know your Roman numerals, is one. Oxygen over here, if you look on top, it has six valence electrons. 
So hydrogen has one valence electron. Oxygen has six valence electrons. And we look at that and we say, oh, wait, there are two hydrogens. The only way you can make this work is high oxygen in the center. Oxygen has the six valence electrons. And I drew the Lewis structure for oxygen atom. Each hydrogen has one. And this hydrogen says the oxygen, oh, look. I have one valence electron unpaired, a single one. You have a single one. Let's share. And they do. And on the other side, this hydrogen says, I've got one unpaired electron, valence electron, and oxygen. You have one. Let's share. And they do. And what does that look like? but the non-bonding electrons from the oxygen are still there. Now, remember I talked about the octet rule. Atoms want to have eight valence electrons. There's one exception to the octet rule, and that's hydrogen. Hydrogen's octet is two. Hydrogen's octet is two. If you notice, shared and unshared electrons, valence electron, that hydrogen and that hydrogen has two valence electrons. So it's happy. It has this octet. And that's the one exception. The octet is two. But now if we look at oxygen, the shared and non-bonding electrons, which is the bonded and non-bonding, I'll do in blue, It has an octet, so it's happy. So water has two hydrogen, one oxygen. I'll draw it again. And each one of these pair of shared electrons is a covalent chemical bond. And the next time you drink some water, remember, the hydrogens are covalently bonded to the oxygen in there. There are two covalent bonds in water. Bet you never thought of that, but there is. If I look at the clock, I think we might be able to sneak one more in. Let's see what I have on my ones to try. Yep. I'm going to let you try this one. Ammonia. And ammonia is a very important chemical. Now it has nitrogen and hydrogen, three of them. Now, how do we need the valence electrons? And since we're almost out of time, I'll help you out. Hydrogen still has one valence electron. Nitrogen over here, chemical symbol N, has, look on top. Remember, the number on top is the valence electrons. Atomic number is total electrons, five electrons. And why don't you try drawing the Lewis structure for ammonia, NH3? I'll give you a hint. Nitrogen has to be in the center. Again, hint, nitrogen has to be in the center.
you yeah, this is why he can't really type some of the answers in easily or at all in a PDF file or even a Word document. Yep. That's, that's just, and if you don't have a printer, like I said, you can hand write things. All right, let's do this. I have nitrogen. It has five valence electrons. So I'll put one dot on each side and then double up. Each hydrogen, there are three of them, has one valence electron. And this hydrogen says to the nitrogen, I have a single valence electron. You have one, let's share, and they do. And this one says the same thing, let's share, and they do. And this one does also. So what does it look like? Nitrogen, the non-bonding electrons are still there. And this is the structure. Each hydrogen has its octet, remember it's two. And the nitrogen bonded and non-bonding electrons, two, four, six, eight. That's the octet, eight valence electrons. And for each hydrogen, remember its octet is two valence electrons. And that's ammonia. And if I look at the clock, time flies when we're having fun with valence electrons and molecules and bonds, chemical bonds. We're done for today. I'm done for the week. Now, remember, a week from today will be test one. Study for it. The best way to study for it is watch the videos and do the practice problems. And for your grade, don't forget, hand in labs that are due. If you haven't gotten your lab kit yet, email me. I'll give you an extension until you get it. Hopefully you'll get it next week. Uh, I will put out an email. I just got it this morning uh, from the company. There was some things going back and forth through some of the, uh, the fa full-time faculty member in charge of 1105. And they gave, which I didn't realize, uh, the email that's the best direct way to contact our customer service. You uh, called the helpline. That's for K through 12 plus college. And you might have to wait. And you also, the person has to figure out what you want. The email I'll address, I'll send out today or tomorrow morning. That is for college students for us. And I'll be able to help you. Don't forget, hand in labs, do the practice problems, which will help you get a good grade on tests. And with that, I'll say, gang gazunt. I'll see you on Monday.